You can download downloads. 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 Iso Guaychi Devaru. Awesome to be with you. I'm Pastor Tim Holman from Grace Lutheran Church and Bishop and Mammoth Lakes Lutheran Church. A reading from Samuel 17. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. We love David and Goliath stories, don't we? The movie Hoosiers tells such a story. In it, a basketball team from a small high school in Indiana makes it all the way to the state finals and faces a team from a large high school. The coach of the team uses an unexpected strategy and guides his team to win the championship. Well, speaking of an unexpected strategy, Conventional warfare was common in the time of Saul. It involved armies with thousands of soldiers. So it was unusual for Goliath to suggest that he and one man from the Israelite army battle. No one was ready to meet Goliath. Goliath represented multiple armies of the Philistines. Goliath had a helmet of bronze and a coat of mail. He had a bronze armor and a javelin. His spear was sturdy and heavy a powerful weapon. There was a standoff, and after 40 days, one man named David, representing the army of the Israelites, finally came forward. David's weapons were unconventional. He came forward with a slingshot, and he came in the name of the Lord of hosts. David was ready for him. Goliath cursed David by his gods, but as we know, David had the advantage and ultimately the victory. We all face well-armed Goliaths in our daily lives, the devil, the world, and the sinful flesh, but we're well-armed with the Word of God. In Christ, we win by confessing the name of Jesus and speaking the Word and looking to the cross as a reminder that Jesus is our rock, our refuge, and our resurrection. In Jesus' name, I'm Pastor Tim Homan from Mammoth Lakes Lutheran Church and Grace Lutheran Church in Bishop. I apologize now in advance for the bad audio on this. We've had this since June. We've been embarrassed by the quality of the audio, but we feel that these EMS heroes from Sierra Wave need to be seen and during some of the interview heard. We apologize to your lifelight. Next year, we'll get this down perfect. From Sierra Lifelight, and we're going to interview them and find out what exactly they do uh, at Sierra Lifelight. So let's start from uh, left to right and we'll work around. I obviously already said that you were the pilot, but tell us who you are. Sure, my name is Brandon Nafe. Hi Brandon. Ari. Ari. Heather. Hi Heather. Chuck Spencer. Hey, hey Chuck. Uh, Craig. Hey Craig. So talking about positions, we know you're the pilot. What's the pilot do? Sure, well it's my job to get these guys from point A to point B safely and um, in a timely fashion. Yeah, and you have to do, for your job, you have to do like uh, log records beforehand. You, it, you do quite a bit. Yeah, don't you? I, mean, I, mean, I remember when we did every 15 minutes and we needed to go out. I don't think you were the pilot for that one, but they had no. to do all kinds of clearance who was on the plane. For sure. I mean, yeah, there's a there's a structure and a system behind it. And so, you know, we have to make sure that the plane is airworthy. That's the, the logs and record keeping you're talking about and uh, checking for flights. So the weather, the airports we're using. Uh, any limitations on the planes, you know, uh, just to keep the ball rolling smoothly. I work directly with the dispatchers as well, so they'll call me and I'll call these guys. And um, the idea is to make all of that happen within, you know, just a few minutes of every call. Wow. Yeah. That's quite the job. What about you? I'm a flight paramedic. Okay. Um, so I work with an, a nurse and we take patients from point A to point B. Be all right. And Heather? I'm a flight nurse. I work with my medic partner and same thing, just pretty much make sure that we get the patient as safely and as stably from point A to point B. Awesome. Uh, I'm a flight paramedic, same as Ariana and Craig. Okay, Craig. <laughs> as Chuck said, I'm also a flight paramedic. All right. Uh, 
How many years have you been with the company? Uh, four now. Wow. Almost five. Almost five. A little over a year. Okay. Almost six. Almost six. Two years. Two years. All right. Um, let's talk about how you got here. What what brought you your history to become a pilot at Sierra Light Flight? So it was sort of an accident. Um, prior. Not in the plane. <laughs> no, no, not in okay, the plane. Good, so good, good. so prior prior to doing this job, uh, I was flying cargo to Bishop. And happily, I was parking next to our current hangar for close to two years. And I didn't know who lived there, you know, until a month or two before I was planning on looking for a new job. So it all just kind of worked out. And, um, and uh, it turned out to be a very good thing. Wow. Definitely a good move. Awesome. I'm real happy. What were you flying? What were you doing cargo for? Uh, I was flying a feeder route for UPS. Okay. So it was from SoCal to Bishop. And... Uh, in a comparably sized plane, you know, so the transition was relatively easy. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, what about you? Um, I moved here about 10 years ago. I got a job working for Simon's Ambulance as an EMT and then went to paramedic school and spent six years there, worked with Sierra Life Flight crews, and they were just so dialed all the time. Um, and so when I had enough experience, I came to work for them. Well, we're going to talk about experience and training in a bit. You'll probably be the one we come back to. Heather. <laughs> I have, my background was working as an ICU nurse, so I had often received patients from flight crews before, but I had never been on the other side, and it's something I'd always been interested in, and I kind of just fell into this position, and it ended up working really well. So being an ICU nurse, that really has to help out in what you do on the plane. Yeah. Good imagine. Chuck. I had a couple of friends that worked here, and one of them called and said, hey, are you interested in being a flight medic? And I said, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I came up and interviewed and got hired. And what did you do before? Uh, ground ambulance, uh, and I also worked in the ER. Now talking about a ground ambulance, you know, I'm sure that there's some similarities because on the ground we have potholes, but I think we have bigger potholes in the sky. Would that be true? That is correct. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Just go with the flow. One, one bounce at a time. You ride the Sierra wave. You ride the Sierra wave. <laughs> All the way over here. Okay. Yeah, um, when I was working on the ground in Kern County, I uh, transported a uh, air crew to a local hospital to pick up a patient, and uh, they gave me a little tchotchke with uh, the phone number on it, and I decided to call, and it was a pretty good decision. And how many years ago was that again? About two years ago. Two years ago. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, what you like most about the job. Cause Every one of you said that you're really happy to be here. What do you like most about the job? <sighs> oh, shoot. Um, the, the transition from the cargo world, one of the biggest things I, I didn't like about that was flying solo constantly. So it very much is the team currently, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you I, by I, yourself. Right. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that I expected to love everyone so much and to, to just, you know, enjoy my time with them full time. Um, it definitely helps that what we do is far more worthwhile than flying boxes, you know? So overall, it's, it's, it's those two things. You're saving lives. Yeah, I think uh, helping the local community um, and also the sunsets at 14,000 feet don't hurt. Hmm. Wow. Um, I love just being able to feel that I can do some really great things for my patients without having to go through a lot of like the red tape that you would at hospitals. I have a really great, like really core team that I work with and I have awesome bosses. <laughs> Just because they're standing over there, you don't have to say that. <laughs> I know they're awesome people, I like them too. Uh, it's a team mentality. Yeah. Uh, everybody, including the pilots, we're all team. Nobody does anything without the other one knowing or approving. Hmm. Uh, we work well together and even when we're off, it's more family oriented. Uh, we're a real close knit group here at this base. That's awesome. And uh, I like it. I don't mind coming up here and staying a week and a half or whatever. We're going to get to talking about being up here in a minute. Greg. Yeah, I enjoy uh, the advanced couple practice and, uh, and uh, being with a group of professionals that really do and love their job. Okay, let's, let's, let's see what and we're going to exclude you from this one because you're the pilot, but what drove each of you four into wanting to be in the medical profession? 
Uh, when I was 12, my grandma was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and the hospice nurses were incredible. And that kind of started my journey. All right. I was always kind of like a nerd when I was growing up with like the human body and just thinking how everything worked and how like, you know, medicine and science have evolved, but that was just something that I wanted to be a part of. I'm just an adrenaline junkie. I like the flow. <laughs> <laughs> I like the excitement. Okay. <laughs> Before this, I was a high-rise window cleaner, so. Oh, really? Yes. Did you say a high-rise window cleaner? Yes. Wow. And I lost the passion for that after nearly 14 years. Huh. Wow. Great. Well, my mother had a stroke about a decade ago, and we didn't understand what it was at the time, so... Just the professionalism of uh, the EMS crews on the scene mm. really kind of drove me to get into this business. What keeps you here? I mean, really, the things I already listed. You know, I think I think I think uh, it absolutely helps that the area we live in is just amazing. You know, it's just really cool. So, from a uh, lifelong perspective, I can see it. Awesome. Yeah, the crew in the area. Absolutely. Um, the crew, the area, like I said, but also just kind of the training and the skills, like this company and like this base is so great about making sure that we're like top tier on everything that we do. So just feeling like I'm able to advance in my practice. Nice. Crew. The crew. <laughs> I like the area as well. Yeah. And uh, I just don't want to start over anywhere else. I've work my way up here a little bit and I enjoy it here and I just don't want to start over again. Okay. Um, just like everyone else said, the, you know, just the people I work with are incredible. And our management is also pretty damn good. And they are I, good people. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen anything better in EMS, so. Awesome. All right. Now, do you live local? I, I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's how much I like it. Uh, <laughs> that's that's how much I like it. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I I don't think it comes down to like it. I think uh, I think a lot of people like their jobs here, and we're gonna as we go around, we're gonna find out that people like their jobs but don't live here. I live here. You live here. Yeah. Um, I'm working on living here. Ah, okay. What's keeping you? Is it the housing prices? Trying to find places because I know we're landlocked. It. But the listings on Zillow are few and far between. They are. Uh, I live up here. We're lucky enough that we have um, crew housing provided for us when we're on shift. But otherwise, I live in the LA area. So that's a commute. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how how often do you have? How long are your shifts when you're up here? And we do um, twenty four hour shifts, and we have one shift that's three days, um, twenty four on, twenty four off, for a total of five. And then we're off for about seven days, and then we do another that's four days on for a total of nine days, and then we're off for about nine days. So I drive up about twice a month. Okay, that's not too bad. Yeah. What about you, Jen? Uh, Palm, Palm Desert, Joshua Tree area up in the yeah. high desert. But, and you like riding motorcycles out there, right? Uh, bikes yes. and stuff? Yeah. My adrenaline junkie. I do, here. quad. Yeah. And so you're the same schedule then? Mm hmm. Okay. Great. Yeah, I live uh, in the Los Angeles area. Do you? So he's the same. Are yeah. you looking to relocate or are you just... Uh, I would love to you once, uh, you know, housing market crashes and then... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I hope the housing market doesn't crash, but uh, I hope that somehow you win the lottery, you decide to stay working here, and you can buy an expensive house. How's that work out? That'd be uh, great. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a day in the life of the EMS, but let's start with, uh, since I know you're the pilot, but we're going to include you in this. Tell us about the day in the life of the pilot. Uh, there's obviously, you're not always on a call. There's a few a day maybe. And uh... um, Yes, yeah, so my schedule is different than theirs. I don't operate on 24s, so it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off, and uh, we, we alternate day and night every other shift. But um, in that time... Uh... Wait, so... <laughs> <laughs> you just blew my sleeping schedule, Mike. So... Did I hear you correctly? So one day you're working day, and then another one you're working night? Yeah, so it, we alternate uh, every every other rotation. So this would be on a bi-weekly basis, or some, depending on, on the schedule. But for example, mine would be seven days on days, a week off, and then seven days on nights, and then a week off. Oh, okay. So right. it's not like every other one. No, oh, no. Oh my goodness, 
So, I don't know how that would so within that 12 hours, the morning consists of really prepping everything for the day. Uh -huh. um, the airplane, making sure everything is, is ready to roll. Um, you know, it's the paperwork's in order, it's airworthy, it's gassed up and, and taken care of. Uh, and working with these guys to make sure that they're good to go with me. Um, and uh, yeah, so once once all of the you know the prep work is done, really, it's it's playing the waiting game. And since I'm local, it's I spend the day at home until I'm working. So you know, it's yeah, it's it's definitely ideal. Day in the life of an EMS. Tell us. Uh, so, yeah, kind of a similar idea. We get to work um, at, our, at the beginning of our shift change and we do a handoff with the other crew. Uh, and once we've done that, we check out our bags, make sure everything in the airplane is good to go and our equipment's ready and just wait for whatever happens to happen. Um, I mean, the same thing. We make sure we, like, we all have hangar duties. We make sure that um, the plane's ready. If there's any extra training or education that we have to do online, we make sure we're caught up on that. Um, like quality assurance, quality control with like looking at what previous crews have done and then just waiting and seeing what happens next. Hmm. Do you guys have anything that you want to add to that or is it pretty much they summed it up? That's pretty yeah. much it. All right. That's uh, you were talking about uh, like education that you might need to do online. Let's talk about training. What's the training consist of to get you where you are as an E and then I know it's different because we got uh, your your nurses and then we have um, what would be the what's the other term? Paramedics. Paramedics. So so let's the let's start with paramedics. What's the training consist of? Because you obviously don't just go to EMT school and the next thing you are in a plane. You, there's there's got to be things you've got to do to get there, right? <laughs> well, you go through EMT school. It takes about six to become an EMT. Basics. Six months. Uh, six years. About six months. Okay. Right. And uh, once you get through with that. Uh, there's a clinical rotation ambulance right along for 12 hours. Um, then you work on a full-time ambulance, be it 911 based or just inter-facility transfer based. Uh, they prefer 911 and then you can apply to medic school, but you're supposed to be uh, a year full-time EMT before you can go to medic school. And what is medic school? Uh, going EMT. through paramedic school, it's all the advanced stuff, uh, intubations, needle thoracostomies, IVs, uh, medications, okay. uh, running the codes and stuff. Right. Uh, and then uh, once you get accepted into that, you got three months of didactic, uh, the book work, and then three months of uh, clinicals in the hospitals, various, uh, you go through respiratory, ER, trauma, burn center and labor and delivery and then um, peds. You have yeah, a peds you guys rotation. might have to deliver babies up there, huh? Yeah. Have you done that? Up there, no. And have any of you had to deliver? On the ground, there? yes. On the ground, yes. <laughs> anybody do that in the air? No? <laughs> I couldn't imagine that'd be easy. Uh, all right, what about the, the nurse side of things? Um, I mean, obviously, you have to go through nursing school, which is getting your free recs. And, and how long does that take, nursing school? Um, for an associate's degree is about two years. For uh -huh. a bachelor's degree is about four. And is it, it's hard to get into nursing school. Isn't there a high demand to try to get in? Yeah, right now there's definitely a demand, and it is, um, it's pretty competitive to get in, and it's pretty competitive to stay in. Really? Yeah. Okay. And then after nursing school, um, in order to be hired here, you have to have three to five years of either ER or ICU experience. And for the ER, they prefer something like trauma-based or at least like high level. And then ICU, um, either like a cardiac, neuro, or trauma focus. And then we also have to be um, specialty certified as either a certified ER nurse or a certified critical care nurse. Hmm. And then do you have to do that for a certain amount of time on the ground before you can be in a plane? Is there a difference there? Um, th just you have to have three to five years of the hospital experience. Three to five years of the hospital, okay. Uh, and so my next question I think would be moot then because I was going to talk about the scope of practice. Did we just kind of talk about that? Um, kind of similar. Is a little bit more? There's certain, like, there are some differences between what, like, nurses and medics can do. A lot of it when we're in the air, like, I always think of my partners as my equals. Um, but just certain things in terms of, like, medications or some procedures that technically a nurse has to do versus a medic. But 
for the most part, we all work under the same level. And so the nurse sits at the front of the plane, right? And um, the medic is at the back? We kind of sit facing each other with the patient in between. That way right. we can work The patient's right next to or, us. Yeah. <clears throat> so you, but you would be more towards the back and she'd be more... I'd be the right back. at the patient's, like, hip line. Right, okay. And we were, we were talking off camera about something where you guys are strapped in because of turbulence and things like that. And it, it sometimes becomes difficult, so you guys are handing things off to each other. Is that right? Mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that work? Can you give us an it's example on the air? Anticipation of what's going to happen, how the patient's going to go. Um, and we'll have everything ready. Uh, that way, either one of us, it's actually within reach. Um, and if we can, if it's a medication thing and it's smooth enough, then we'll have to switch spots and the nurse will push her meds. Uh, if it's intubation or whatever, uh, where we're going to have to RSI and rapid, RSI, what's that? rapid sequence okay. induction okay. and uh, to basically paralyze and sedate the patient so they can stop fighting and we can now intubate them and breathe for them. Mm. Um, then we'll switch spots and the nurse will do the RSI medication and the medic will go to the head of the bed and keep breathing for the patient. And then once the patient becomes sedated, we intubate them and secure an airway. Hmm. Let's talk about the pilot's job here. So you're flying the plane. You have to be relaying information to them, don't you? <clears throat> uh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I mean so so there there are points in a flight when when not having to hear all the work that they're doing is helpful to me. Um, we call those the critical phases of flight. Uh, but generally speaking, outside of that, open communication for us is absolutely important. Uh, if I can shoot for shortcuts to get them places faster, maybe change the pressure pressurization in the plane to help accommodate the patient. You know, there, there, there are a million different things that they might like from me at any given time, and I would like them to have that right away. So open communication, even in the plane, is, is absolutely important. Uh, <clears throat> I was talking with Lisa off camera, and she told me something about CAMPS, and I have no clue what that is. Would somebody explain what this CAMPS is? And I think it's C-A-M-P-S, is that right? What is that? Yeah, CAMES is an accreditation that we just got um, a month ago now, oh, and okay. um, it's something we've been working towards for the last three or four years, um, and it's a lot of it's stuff that we've been doing for a really long time, but I think getting the paperwork in order and making sure every box was checked to uh, get that certification, it's uh, really exciting for us. And, and what's that do for you? What's the what's that open up for the future? Oh, um, basically the CAMES certification just says that we are um, performing and functioning in a way that is safe and above and beyond oh. um, what other people might be doing. Good job. Congratulations, guys. It's a good thing for the team. Uh, <coughs> uh, let's talk about blood. Who wants to tell us about that? We have blood. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's something new, right? It's something new. Uh, we keep two units of blood uh, in refrigerators, and we take it with us uh, for like scene calls. Uh, we'll be taking it with us on all calls. But, but did that change things? Like, I think we were talking at one point where you no longer, like, you can get a direct drop off from an ambulance to the plane? We can get that direct drop off. the hospital. We maybe. can get the scene call. The, the uh, I guess it would be the handoff from EMS instead of going to the hospital. Uh, we can eliminate the middleman, which is the hospital and uh, take them directly to the point where they get more definitive care. Mm. Uh, but the blood uh, for like traumas and stuff like that uh, can actually save their lives uh, because they're, we're going to prevent them from bleeding out and we will replace any blood that's lost. Mm. So it just it buys them the extra time they may need to get into OR to repair whatever's damaged. Now Brandon, back to you. Tell us about the aircraft. Uh, we fly a Pilatus PC-12. It's a single-engine turboprop. Um, and, uh, I mean, just, just to kind of give you a visual, it's, it's roughly the size of, like, a small business jet. But the thing is built to fly to, uh, 
uh, what's the word? Uh, run runways that may not be ideal, right? So it can operate on gravel, you know, it can operate on grass. And so it allows us to go to really rural areas with, with short runways uh, and haul quite a bit of weight, um, moving relatively fast. So it's, it's pretty ideal for what we do, I want to say. Um, so if my mother-in-law were still alive, we'd be able to get it. We, we definitely I'm could. I she was not She <laughs> <laughs> was a great lady. Bad joke. Tell yeah. us about your qualifications. Um, so, so to operate on this job, you have to have a commercial pilot's license. Um, so in my case, it would be single engine, although I have single multi. Um, and then if you're flying a twin, uh, there, there are other bases that fly twins, and in which case you need a multi-engine. For the CAME certification, you need an ATP in addition. So that's the air transport pilot certificate, uh, which is a lot rougher to get. Um, and it takes... Uh, Quite a bit of training, but once once the training is done, really they're just uh, hourly values that you need to have the necessary experience in the eyes of the company. Did you have to add those on after you were a UPS pilot to get this job? No, so I, I came equipped with you everything already. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's talk about coping mechanisms. <clears throat> Obviously, this is a difficult job. Um, I think things in my mind would be is you have a patient here you're trying to stabilize but you got HIPAA uh, stuff as well and you don't always know whether the patient makes it once you deliver them there and stuff um how do you cope with stuff like that i mean you just... we can find out how the patient did oh you can yes because we had initial care as oh, well okay. so was, we're I, in I that misinformed. we're in that realm where we can pass on information to them and then we can send it through there like the if we take someone to the emergency department we'll get in touch with the pln okay and ask how the patient's doing what was the outcome because we had initial care oh okay um, what about though like the you have to see some pretty graphic stuff at times oh yes how do you deal with that everybody deals with it differently yeah uh, you have uh, help through your yes, we we have our crisis care intervention. Right. Um, uh, we can always talk to Mike and Lisa. We talk to each other. Uh, we can always go for crisis care intervention anytime we need it. And uh, I think a few of us have actually gone through it. Yeah. 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 Couldn't imagine what you guys see on a daily basis. All right. Back to the pilot. What do you do for fun here? Because we live in the eastern Sierras. We've got fishing, hiking, we've got uh, skiing, yeah. bouldering. What's your passion here? Um, I mean, definitely, definitely work at the home gym is, is my favorite thing of all the things, I think. I, I, I left this out earlier. Not sound like a toolbox, but Sierras, oh, I, oh, I know, but is your, is your no, it, it, it really is, though, because we, we have every day after shift change you know we knock out the important things and everyone is invited and it's it's good fun it's time for Atlantis to rise go get it Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom rated PG-13 December 22nd <gasps> You gotta get ready for our family migration! This isn't about migration, it's about adventure!